Hey everybody, happy Friday. John Lorden here with your episode of Brain Scratch. I kind of feel like this is a special episode because it's a collaboration with several people. This is resulting from a special private investigator breakout session that I did at CrimeCon last weekend. Uh, essentially, this was something where you could pay an extra amount of money for this special experience. There was over a dozen private investigators that were getting together to take smaller groups through multiple exhibits about one particular crime. That is the case that we're covering today. Well, actually, there's a bit of a question. Is it a crime? Is it not? Uh, we're going to get into all that stuff. But before I get started, I want to give a very big thank you to Sheila Waisaki, who is the primary private investigator on this case. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be sitting literally right next to her. Uh, though she was pretty popular, I was able to steal some of her time and talk about this case. And she also collaborated with uh, Gray Hughes, who many of you that are fans of this channel might know because I talk about him pretty frequently. Uh, he actually created some 3D assets for this investigation, and uh, Sheila already knew about me through Gray. So thank you, Gray, for mentioning that. And thank you to both of you for providing me with information that we're going to be showing to you here on the Brain Scratch show today. And a special thank you to Brain Scratcher, Kim Stubick, who I actually ran into at the PI breakout session. And unfortunately, I signed up for it relatively late in the game. Uh, apparently, if you sign up early enough, you were given a bunch of different materials, transcripts, um, 911 call information, all kinds of stuff. And I missed out on all that. But thanks to Kim, she forwarded me, forwarded all that information to me. So Kim, you're my special co-researcher on today's episode. Thank you so much for the help. And this episode is going to be a little bit different because we're reviewing some articles, some of the digital assets created by Gray Hughes. Uh, I've got some pictures I want to go through you got with you guys with how many times can I say with uh, and I also even have paper uh, literally the multimedia format presentation we're doing here but this is Sheila Waisaki, uh, the private investigator that I was fortunate enough to spend so much time with over this past weekend and helped put this episode together as well. Uh, let's learn a little bit about her before we jump into the case. Sheila Waisaki, mother of two, became a professional private detective after she solved her former roommate's murder. The case had gone cold for more than 30 years. Waisaki founded the nonprofit organization Without Warning, Fight Back, and produced the short documentary, What Would You Do If You Were Attacked? And quite honestly, she's gotten a lot of exposure. Um, she's been on 2020. I was just watching her on a Crime Watch Daily episode as well. She's taking on some fairly tough cases, which I really appreciate uh, that there's people out there willing to do that. Um, so what is today's case? It is about this man, Jonathan Cruz, and it does take place in... Uh, I believe it's Coppell. I've, I've heard it pronounced a few different ways. Coppell, Coppell. Uh, it's a city in the northwest corner of Dallas County in the U.S. state of Texas. It's a, sub a suburb of Dallas. Population was 38,659 as of the 2010 census. So um, just to give you some idea of where this case is taking place. Moving over to heavy.com with one of their usually pretty excellent articles on five fast facts you need to know. Um, I have to say this one's a little bit light, but we're gonna sit, we're gonna get some information uh, from it here. On February 2nd, 2014, 26 year old Brenda Lazaro reported that her boyfriend, Jonathan Cruz, had committed suicide in his bed. Lazaro claims she and Jonathan were having an argument about another woman when Jonathan said he'd prove his love to her and seconds later shot himself in the chest. Cruz's family, however, firmly believes that Brenda's story is false. So if you can imagine already uh, this situation and all of it takes place in a bedroom, basically, you've only got two people there. One of them is now deceased. How do we get to the truth of what happened here? Uh, one thing that's good about this case is it really only boils down to two avenues. Either he did this to himself or she did this to him. Uh, now, in terms of her doing this to him, I do imagine that there could be uh, some potential there that maybe it was intentional. 
uh, maybe it was accidental. And it's interesting because I haven't heard too many people theorize that she had actually potentially accidentally killed him. Um, I've heard theories that he might have accidentally done it because there's this really interesting piece of information when it comes to the gun that the ammo clip was actually not in it. It only had one in the chamber. So in terms of this theory that it was accidental, that someone was being dramatic in, in a big fight to try to scare the other person, quite honestly, I see that it could potentially go either way. But let's go ahead and continue here, learn a little bit more about Jonathan. Uh, he was a 27-year-old urgent care director. He is survived by his parents, brother, and sister. His father, John, works as a pastor in the non-denominational Heartland Church in Carrollton. Pam, Jonathan's mother, is an artist. Uh, his father also for formerly worked as an attorney for, I think, about 30 years, a trial attorney as well. Um, Jonathan shotguns competitively as an adult. I haven't found a lot of information to support that, but it is very clear that uh, he was extremely familiar with firearms. He had several, uh, in, even in his apartment, and he had just moved into that apartment. Uh, from what I recall from the meeting, I believe he had a rifle and as many as four handguns. So this is a person that was very familiar with firearms. As a matter of fact, from this article, we learned that he was just seven when his grandfather first uh, showed him how to shoot a gun. And in his spare time, he also practiced martial arts. And that pastime would be what gets him to cross paths with uh, Brenda. But let's uh, jump over to a memorial page for him. I just wanted to get a bit of a sense of who this person was from other people. Uh, Norman G. Miller notes here that Jonathan was a good American man. He was smart. His passion for the classics is an impressive insight into his sensitivity for art and its importance. Uh, I've gone through a lot of Facebook writing uh, of Jonathan and Brenda's, and I can tell you that, yeah, he, he really has a thing for understanding art, um, giving room to performers. He was upset. I remember one thread in particular where he was upset because someone was playing music and everyone else was... Um, you know, taking pictures and just being kind of noisy all around it. And he thought it was kind of disrespectful to, to the artist and the music. So uh, certainly seems like he had some, um, some different sensibilities than, than a lot of people might. He was basically a Renaissance man. He was a trained fighter, yet a thoughtful person with great friendships and appreciation for the world. He loved nature and the outdoors. Uh, Caitlin Fitzgerald also notes, one of the more appropriate stories that comes to mind was one night Jonathan was craving Houston's ribs. <laughs> Quick little side note, uh, my first date with my wife was actually to Houston's and I remember ordering the ribs and then learning that lesson of being, um, you know, ribs probably aren't good for a first date because <laughs> you're worried the whole time about what's in your teeth and what's going on uh, after that. So quick little tip for you guys out there, don't get ribs on your first date. Um, but back to Jonathan, uh, he was craving Houston's ribs, so he and I drove up there to place an order. After we got back to his house and he had inhaled his dinner, uh, he looked at me with his mischievous grin and proceeded to wipe his barbecued hands all over me. As I was laughing, I asked him how I was going to get clean when he threw me into the pool laughing and said, see, all clean now. There was never a dull moment with my friend of over 13 years. I will never forget him and will keep our memories close at heart. Uh, a lot of sweet sentiments that are left on this page uh, about Jonathan, and it is a heartbreaker of a case. You know, it always gets me uh, when people are taken away from life uh, in their prime. And this is a man that literally just moved into his own apartment. It was his, his own place. He was moving out from his family's home. Uh, he had a good job that was going well for him. I heard an interview with a coworker of his that really seemed to appreciate him. Um, really tough that uh, unfortunately, all these great things that he was setting up have uh, have come to an abrupt close in, in an unexpected way. Uh, moving over to, to dmagazine.com, we're going to learn a bit uh, about how he met Brenda. Jonathan's family explains to police on the scene that Jonathan had no history of depression, and in fact, he recently started a new job that he liked and just moved into his own apartment. He was a meticulous, careful gun owner, drilled on firearm safety since he was a little boy. One thing I want to bring up is I am seeing 
discrepancies discrepancies around uh, his history of depression. This was also brought up at the breakout session, which uh, after we went through all these different exhibits, uh, we came back to the main meeting room and his family was actually there. Both of his parents were there, their attorney was there. Uh, there was also a medical expert that was there. Um, this actually came up and according to his family, they never knew of a history of depression. And I believe they've even gone as far as getting access to his medical records. And there is nothing noted in there about depression. I know in one of the police reports I saw that there's some mention that uh, he was supposed to be taking some type of antidepressive medication. I don't know where that information is coming from. And literally his, his parents said the exact same thing. We don't know where this thing about him struggling with depression comes from. Um, by all accounts, after soaking myself into this case as much as I have over the past week, I can tell you that friends of his thought he was very likable, like the example we just heard, kind of a fun guy. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's not to say that people that, that have that personality aren't necessarily depressed. I, I, I certainly know better than that. But uh, for signs of depression, I'm really not seeing them outside of specifically issues that he's having in dealing with his relationship, which we're going to get into a bit more as we go forward here. Uh, but Brenda, 26, says it was suicide. She tells police that she spent the night with her boyfriend watching TV and eating Chinese food and fighting about a woman named Emily. Brenda says she was at the foot of the bed sitting on the floor when Jonathan told her to cover her ears. She says that's when she heard the gunshot. And this is a picture of her. Um, I have another picture of her here for you guys. There we go. So you have a sense of what she looks like as we go forward. Jonathan and Brenda met at Wu Yi Shaolin, a martial arts school in a Capel strip mall just a few blocks from the River Chase apartments where he was living. Brenda was a teacher there and a close friend of Jonathan's sister, Danny, who took classes at Wu Yi. Jonathan's mom, Pam, also took classes there. Um, so we have a lot of connectivity centered around that martial arts studio. Uh, interesting note here, this is actually from his friend and former college roommate. He says, uh, Jonathan, first of all, he says he was a messy roommate, um, which is interesting because we just heard he was meticulous in another spot. But according to his roommate, uh, he was a bit messy and he was such a deep sleeper that he had to set three alarms to make sure that he didn't miss class. He'd have a traditional alarm clock, an alarm on his phone, plus another one that actually vibrated his pillow. And then his friend Jacob says, the fourth alarm was me hitting him on the head with my pillow. Uh, here we have a, another picture of Jonathan with his dog, Ulysses. And from what I understand, there was a dog in the apartment when this happened as well. I don't know if it was Ulysses. Um, based on the timing that I'm seeing here, I think it was, but I just want to put out there uh, in the meeting, it was clear that there was a dog that was also in there. I'm not sure if it necessarily was Ulysses, um, but it was his dog. So I'm assuming if Ulysses was still alive, he was probably living with him. Uh, over at CrimeOnline.com, did Jonathan Cruz really kill himself? Jealous girlfriend only witness to, quote, suicide. Earlier that same day, Jonathan reportedly had lunch with two close friends, Emily and Jacob Ramsey. Though Emily and Jacob are now married, they weren't married at the time, Brenda was jealous of her friendship with Jonathan. And Emily is believed to have been a regular source of conflict in Brenda and Jonathan's relationship since the time the friends hugged each other in front of Brenda. Uh, basically, it sounds like Jonathan tried to put a double date together so that his friends could meet Brenda and the double date didn't go well. Um, when they showed up, Jonathan gave both of his friends a hug and apparently Brenda got very upset at the fact that he had hugged Emily. Uh, it, Emily recalls it that uh, Brenda basically practically didn't speak through the whole thing. Uh, Emily was trying to start conversation, asking her questions. Brenda was giving her one word responses. Um, so it was clear that Brenda was upset about something. Jacob and Jonathan discussed the conflict at their lunch that Sunday afternoon, uh, the Sunday that he was killed, which was coincidentally Super Bowl Sunday. And Jonathan was telling them how Brenda was threatened by his friendship with Emily when his girlfriend, Brenda, called him and asked to speak to Emily. She just started yelling at me and telling me that I was a disrespectful little girl. You hug my man. That's so rude, Emily says. 
Now, I did, like I mentioned, I cracked into a bunch of Facebook communication around this, um, not around this particular instance, but around other instances. And Jonathan and Brenda actually had discussions specifically about um, hugging people or like kissing people, you know, friends that would come up and kiss you on the cheek and how they really shouldn't do that. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure what Jonathan's position on that necessarily was from his response with Brenda. Brenda was kind of raising the points more often. Um, it did seem that there was some jealousy that I saw in both directions. Brenda was in communication with a former ex-boyfriend of hers. It seemed like Jonathan wasn't real happy about that. She said she said that she stopped doing that. Um, unfortunately, there is a lot of what I usually consider rumor mill aspect to this case, but because there is so little in terms of physical evidence, I think there's a lot of that information that is being reviewed um, in some attempt to try to understand the mindsets that are going on here. But uh, what's clear to me is this wasn't a couple that was doing very well together. They had only been together for three months. And literally, this is the type, the type of couple that was fighting all through Christmas Eve, all through Christmas Day. Uh, sounds like they almost broke up on Christmas Day, and then they kind of patched it back up. Um, there was just a lot of conflict in their communication, at least based on what I've seen. And admittedly, I'm looking at things that have been clipped out. So of course, those are the things that are going to be shown. But for a three-month relationship, there is a lot. There is a lot of it. There are many indicators in there that uh, if I was in Jonathan's shoes, I, I would have been hitting the door. And the thing is, I think Jonathan was right on the edge of doing the right thing and getting out of a bad relationship. Uh, he had spoken to his friends about it when they were out at this lunch. He's, he was saying that that's pretty much it. I, I know I have to end it. I'm going to end it today. Uh, he had previously spoken to his sister about it, sent her a message about all the different options he had. Uh, you know, well, I could stay with her, hopefully try to work it out. I could try, you know, basically he wasn't going to let go of his friends. And he, in his conversation with his sister, came to the conclusion that it would be best for him to end the relationship with Brenda uh, and just try to minimize the damage. Emily says she got a strange text message from Jonathan the night he died. It said, I want to die. Emily and Cruz family now believe that Brenda sent the text message to cover her tracks. Uh, and interesting to note, I've seen all kinds of different things reported on what time that text message came. Some people say it happened during the day. I believe it happened close to 11 o'clock at night. 10.52 is one of the times that I've heard kicked around on that, uh, which... By 11:30, I believe she's on the phone with 911. So certainly in the in the time frame where potentially she could have grabbed his phone and maybe sent that text message. Another interesting thing to know about their relationship is because of some of their doubts in terms of trusting each other, it seems like they had actually shared passwords with each other. I at least know specifically she had his Facebook password. Uh, he communicated with her at certain times saying it's all ready for your review, almost with a little sarcasm kind of in there um, that he'd gone through and like removed old messages from ex-girlfriends or things like that. Uh, so there was certain Certainly the ability, I believe, for her to have sent that text message. The medical examiner reportedly ruled that Jonathan's cause of death was undetermined, and police have said there is not enough evidence to charge Brenda or anyone with the young man's death. Cruz's family has filed a civil suit against their son's former girlfriend, who is now married with a child. Uh, and the lawyer for the civil suit was at the Q&A session, at the PI breakout session, um, he seems very, very confident that uh, he's going to get a good result. And it's curious because everything I've looked through, I really want to focus on the, the physical evidence to try to determine the truth and things like this. But when it comes to a civil suit, things kind of change a little bit. And they're basically throwing in a ton of information to support what many would consider a circumstantial evidence case. But in terms of tons of information to show that you know, Brenda might have a predisposition to being violent, um, to harming herself and possibly others. There's a lot of compelling information out there. So it's going to be very interesting to see how that case goes. I believe it's scheduled currently for July, if I recall correctly. Um, but we will see. So, of course, we now get to the 911 call. I just wanted to play a clip of this for you guys real quick. Ma'am, I need to 
Kelly, where you are. I have, I have a department. Okay, would, you, on. would you call me? Would I need you to calm down. Which apartment? So as you can hear just from that little clip, uh, high emotion on that phone call. You've got the 911 operator trying to calm her down, trying to get the information that he needs. Ultimately, it takes nearly eight minutes for them to get the location out of her. They literally wind up telling her, go to a neighboring apartment, knock on the door, find someone else, let us know what this address is. Uh, he had only been there for a week or two. Now, surprisingly, she actually helped him find the apartment, uh, but she didn't appear to recall the name of the apartment complex. And if we take a quick look at a Google map of the area here, um, she did remember these cross streets, so she's trying to tell that to them, but literally look at this area. This is an apartment structure. This is apartments. These are apartments. I think up over here, uh, we've also got more apartments. There's more apartments up here. There are tons of apartments uh, all around this intersection. What's terrible, which I didn't realize until I listened to it again today, this is like my third time listening to the entire 911 call, is within the first minute or so, he actually gets the right information but he just doesn't put it together. She knows the apartment number that they're in, and he at one point deduces that it must be River Chase Apartments, asks her, and she confirms it. But then he keeps pushing, saying, well, we actually need an address. I need an address. Uh, now, it might be that the apartment complex is so big that there's multiple addresses depending on what buildings you're in. I certainly understand that. But if you have a call about a gunshot that's happened and you've drilled it down to where the apartments are and you have the number, isn't that enough to at least get the unit off and, off and rolling and trying to get to uh, the location and potentially save this man's life? It's really a struggle uh, that is happening in that 911 call. It's 10 minutes long, so I don't wanna include it in this episode. I'm sure this episode's gonna go long enough already, but I am going to release another video that includes the entire 911 call and a transcript of it on screen at the same time so you can follow through it and go through it. I have to tell you at the PI breakout session, it was a big point of conversation. A lot of people are looking to the 911 call uh, for evidence of what's really going on there. People are suggesting that maybe the call happened much later. Uh, perhaps he was already dead. Uh, and there's some information to support that. The neighbor that she eventually knocked on the door of to find out what the address was for the apartments says that they heard a gunshot approximately 20 to 30 minutes before she actually came to the door. Now, even if we take into consideration the eight minutes of time that it takes before she does that on the phone call that we hear, um, that's still leaving a pretty considerable at least 12 minutes, potentially more of time between the gunshot and her uh, picking up the phone. So pretty compelling information, but you also have to keep in mind, this is uh, people's memories. Uh, I mean, are they really looking at their watch? Was well, That was a gunshot. And then looking at their watch again, oh, if someone's knocking on my door. I don't know how solid that information is. Um, there was other things brought up just in terms of her phrasing. There's one moment in particular that Sheila seems to really key, on, uh, key in on when they are asking, um, did he shoot himself on purpose? And initially she says no, and then she kind of retracts her statement really quick saying yes. And, you know, Sheila thinks it could be a Freudian slip. It could be. I, I really don't know. I struggle with analyzing information in that way because I don't know how valuable it would be in terms of, you know, a court case. Uh, and really, I would like to base my decisions on something much stronger than that. However, I got to tell you guys, after spending so much time in this case and looking at all these different aspects... I would, especially if it was my job, I'd be analyzing that tape to the nth degree. I would be driving myself crazy and trying to find the truth in that tape because it is so close to the moment of what's actually going on there. And it's got uh, our main person of interest all over it. So I understand why it's being analyzed so heavily. I just don't know if the information that could be taken from that could be really leaned on very well. There's also a consideration that this is a woman that is, I believe her family's from Mexico. Um, I think she might uh, be speaking English as a second language. So 
in terms of how she's phrasing things or how she might be uh, stammering and stumbling with her speech, uh, there there might be a reasonable explanation for that in terms of of her own understanding of the language. But uh, it's hard to tell because I really don't have a lot to compare it against. But if you want to check out the whole 911 call, I'll have a link in the description box below. All right, so now we're going to take a look at the crime scene a little bit. And once again, big shout out to my fellow YouTuber, Gray Hughes, who's doing a bunch of good work on his channel, but also professionally in terms of creating um, 3D environments like this so we can get a better understanding of what's going on. This video in particular is an account of what Brenda told the police had happened. And please note here, she's sitting at the foot of the bed. Uh, she's on her phone. Um, Jonathan is up in the bed, the gunshot, uh, he, he speaks to her first saying, I'm going to prove how much I love you, uh, cover your ears, cover your ears. And then there's a gunshot and then she gets up and moves over to his side and places her hand on the wound, which according to the 911 call, she says that she's literally got the phone in one hand. She's got the wound being pressed down with the other. Uh, interesting to note here is the position of the gun. And actually we've got another 3D model from Gray here. Uh, you can see it a bit better in this one. Here's the position of the gun. Uh, by the way, extremely clever use of 360 video. This is honestly the best use that I have seen on YouTube of using 360 video, a 3D rendered environment of a crime scene where you can go through it and, hey, I want to look this way. I want to see what's over here. Beautiful, beautiful work, Gray. And it, I really wanted to share this with you guys. I'll have a link to this down below as well. Um, keep in mind, some of this stuff is being used for the civil trial. I'm trying to omit anything that might risk the trial, uh, but I have gotten approval from Gray and Sheila for showing you guys this. So, so know that we've already talked and I'm I'm just trying to proceed as safely as possible. Um, but look at the the gun, the positioning of the gun here. And what's interesting to understand is the trajectory of the wound. It actually goes in through his uh, left side and it comes out of the right upper side of his back. So for it to be hitting that kind of angle, uh, He's either using his right hand, his right hand in a very strange way where he has to reach com completely across his body, or he's using his left hand also in kind of a strange way where he has to get it up high enough to be able to make that angle. Uh, and keep in mind, we've definitely talked about this on the channel before, when it comes to people harming themselves, particularly males with a firearm, most of the time it's going to be a wound to the head. It is very rare that it's going to be a wound to the chest. And with this particular wound, unfortunately, it made it almost perfectly through his ribs. I think it nicked a little bit of one of his ribs, uh, hit his heart, hit his lung, and hit a part of his liver as well. Just devastating wound and... Um, I don't know, the, the odds of the path that it traveled uh, just kind of amazed me in itself. Where the gun wound up uh, in the bed is very strange to me. Of course, just looking at this whole situation is strange to me. Uh, you have someone that has been arguing with his girlfriend all night and decides he's going to you know, cozy up in bed, pull the blankets up over the lower half of him. Uh, and then he's going to kill himself in a laying position in bed. Just none of that logically really sits very well with me. Um, but the trajectory is also a problem because you got to figure out how his hand is doing that. We're going to get into some more information on the trajectory. I'll show you some different pictures that Gray has also put together on all that. But um, something that really threw me was if you remember in the scenario we saw previously, she was sitting at the foot of the bed. And in this one, uh, I believe Gray had much better detail for the 3D environment because now we're getting details like where the Chinese food was. Um, we've literally got his sword on the wall and his uh, martial arts belts. But here, if we take a look, there is absolutely no space. There's like a little dresser that's over there. There are some things on that dresser. There is a pile of clothes that is at the edge there um, at best. Maybe she was sitting at the corner with her legs facing out that way. Uh, but it would seem to me looking at this room, it would make a lot more sense if she was sitting over here, kind of facing this way. And unfortunately, I can't find really solid information on uh, on her positioning outside of that she was sitting at the foot of the bed and 
I, I've also looked at actual crime scene photos. I can tell you there's no way she's sitting at the foot at the foot of the bed. There's too much stuff there. And there's not enough room between that stuff and this cabinet where the television is. Uh, also, take a look at his position in terms of where he is in bed. Fairly clear to me that uh, she might have been in bed as well. Uh, just looking at his position, I don't know if it's only me, but uh, <laughs> whenever I'm sleeping in a bed, if my wife doesn't happen to be there, I generally gravitate more towards the center. I know some people are edge sleepers. That's certainly not out of the realm of possibility. And considering he's got a, kind of a nightstand over here with his food on it and stuff, perhaps uh, he would have slept on this edge. But we know that she was there. We know if they were hanging out in this room, there is really nowhere else where they could be unless she's going to be sitting on the floor over here somewhere. Uh, even the way the television is angled, I think it's pretty easy to conclude that their normal position of hanging out in this room would be uh, both of them hanging out in bed facing the television. Uh, another thing to talk about in this model is you might count one, two pillows that are on the bed, and then one pillow that is on the ground. A lot of people wonder, is there a missing fourth pillow? Even his mother has specifically asked about this. Uh, and if there is a missing fourth pillow, was that potentially used as some type of silencer? Um, I'm not sure. Unfortunately, we don't have very good information from the police. I don't know if they could do an analysis on how much of the gunpowder actually wound up embedded in his shirt and on his skin. And if they could analyze that and say, oh, well, we can tell that a certain amount of it distributed somewhere else. Um, his mother mentioned that it looked like there might have been particles for something that were found on his shirt. So in that case, it might also suggest that uh, those particles could have been tested and seen if they were materials consistent with a pillow. We don't have the answers, unfortunately. We only have the questions in that case. Another thing that came up in the PI breakout session was the Chinese food. Uh, there was a delivery man when he brought the food. Uh, he heard fighting that was going on in the apartment. Took them a, a bit of a while for them to answer the door and for him to give it to them. And I believe uh, that I think I also noticed in the crime scene photos, the food was actually not, it didn't look like it was actually eaten. It looked like uh, the containers were just kind of there like... Uh, they brought them in, put them there, but they didn't actually get to eating them. So um, is it anecdotal? Does it help the understanding of the case? I'm not sure. One thing I'm wondering about here also is um, this arm that is stretching out. And I suppose that if you believe that he did shoot himself using his left hand, the kick from the gun might have thrown his arm out in that direction. Um but if that's the case, I really doubt that the gun would have landed here. The gun would have likely landed on the table or bounced off the table onto the floor, something along those lines. Uh, so a little bit strange in terms of gun placement once again. If it was someone else that shot him, is it possible? You know, I don't think it's an accident that he has this sword on the wall right next to his bed. Uh, I think there might be a chance that that is something that he put there, uh, not just to be part of his martial arts collection, but a practical use of, you know, if there's an intruder, he's going to be armed fairly quickly if he's in bed. So is it possible he was reaching for that or something? I don't know. But this is the pose that he was found in uh, when, when he was discovered. We also don't know. Could she have moved him? I mean, she said that she had her hand on the gunshot wound. Obviously, with his arm crossed his body like that, she couldn't have really had her hand too directly on it because his arm is is covering. You can see the trajectory markers going right through his arm. Uh, so I wonder about that, too. How much did she manipulate uh, the body when she was going through uh, trying to help him or, or whatever actions that she was taking? So... Uh, let's go ahead and continue forward. I told you guys this was going to be a long one. Um, I'm going to have a link down below to this website. I think it's Karis on crime. I'm not really familiar with it, but they do have a copy here of at least the synopsis of the autopsy report. Um, it's fairly simple. I mean, it's basically, it, it tells you what I've already told you guys. Gunshot goes through heart, lung, and liver. Um, exits out his the right side of his back. What's interesting here is they also have some toxicology results. Uh, I don't think it's, yeah, it's not quite all the results that I've seen on another report, but no alcohol, 
Uh, no cocaine, no marijuana, no amphetamines, no drugs, no alcohol in this guy's system whatsoever. So none of those are a factor in terms of what's going on with this case. Um, I, I'm going to have this link down there because I think it gives you guys enough information. The version of the autopsy report that they sent us is like 50 pages long and has all kinds of additional stuff. But for the main details, uh, this one covers it. So I'm going to have that in the links down below for you as well. Um, here we have an incident report uh, that gives us some more detail I wanted to share with you guys. This came directly in the materials that was sent to the attendees. Uh, Detective Marr stated that the magazine, the clip, the ammo clip for the gun, was noted to not be in the firearm when it was found. And it is suspected that the deceased did not realize there was a cartridge that was chambered when he pulled the trigger. So here's kind of that theory where uh, for some reason they think Jonathan might have been getting dramatic and thought that, you know, he pulled the clip out of the gun and he was going to, you know, click. I don't I don't know what what would the outcome of that drama have been? I have no idea. But they're assuming that he was acting like he was going to shoot himself, didn't know that there was one in the chamber. Uh, Brenda witnessed the entire incident, and she put her hand on the deceased's chest to try to stop the bleeding and called 911. Brenda stated that they had not been drinking or using any illegal drugs and that the deceased was the one who started talking about the other girl. Did you catch a little bit of a weird tone right in the end of that there? Uh, it really sticks out to me. Almost like Brenda is blaming him for all the arguing that was going on that day. I have to tell you, after reviewing a lot of their private communication, that does not surprise me in the least. Uh, this is someone, from my perspective, that is extremely dramatic, uh, really likes that type of engagement with people. Uh, and that, that hug that happened happened months before it, it happened a month into their relationship when he was first trying to introduce her to his friends. Uh, but she kept insisting that he couldn't have uh, her as a friend because it was obvious that he liked her too much, even though she was dating and is now married to his best friend. Now, in preparing for the civil trial, there, there have been numerous uh, depositions that have been recorded. Uh, they are hours and hours long. Thankfully, Gray has created a couple of smaller clips. Um, and I really, I don't feel great about putting out the links to the entire depositions because I haven't reviewed them all for myself. And there could be personal information that's released in there. For example, you know, people talking about where they live or something like that, which would definitely violate YouTube guidelines because not all these people are uh, public figures, of course. And even if they were, you're not supposed to give out um, private information like that. So, but I picked a couple of clips in particular. This is actually a very good friend of Brenda's. And let's see what she has to say. Didn't uh, Brenda tell you that she didn't go to Jonathan's funeral because she, her role wasn't big enough? Yes. Okay. Did you think that was odd? Um, no. Tell me about that. Yeah, so Brenda did not go to Jonathan's funeral. Um, there is communication that you can see between Brenda and Danny, which keep in mind, Danny was uh, Brenda's friend for a couple years uh, before Jonathan started dating her, at least from what I understand. Um, there's communication there where it sounds like Brenda is planning on going to the funeral. Uh, Brenda had actually stayed with the Cruz family for a couple nights uh, after this happened, and she literally slept in Danny's bed, and Danny talks about how uh, she's basically taking care of Brenda when she's waking up in the middle of the night crying. Um, they're making arrangements to go to the funeral together, and then all of a sudden Brenda says, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to make it, and she doesn't go. Then the communication with Danny turns in a very, very bizarre way where Brenda is essentially blaming the family for not representing uh, the relationship that she had with Jonathan at the funeral. And keep in mind, this is three months of a relationship. Uh, but outside of that, Danny's trying to tell her, look, we wanted you to sit with us. We had a spot for you there. Um, I don't know if Brenda was upset because they didn't have a spot for her to speak or something along those lines. That's kind of what it seems like as the communication goes on. But 
what's very clear from that transcript of, of the two of them communicating is uh, you've got an extremely selfish woman here, extremely interested in controlling the narrative to the point where she's actually, uh, it's clear that she has the Facebook login for Jonathan's Facebook account. Uh, Danny asks if they could have the login because they want to c- turn it to a memorial page. And Brenda is concerned about them reading the personal messages. Brenda is concerned about them letting people that were previously blocked, like ex-girlfriends of his, have access to that page again. Um, a lot of control going on in that conversation and a huge amount of insensitivity. I don't even want to tell you guys how bad it gets, but it gets extremely, extremely bad. And it's literally hours after the funeral that she's hammering his sister uh, about all these issues that are really, from my perspective, they're kind of nonsensical, extremely unimportant. And they're showing an extreme lack of of sympathy um, and even respect for for Jonathan. So uh, I don't know. Here we have her friend that uh, you know just thinks no, it's it's not normal for her to avoid the funeral. And perhaps uh, I understand people grieve in different ways. People might might need more space or something along those lines. I totally get that aspect of it. What I don't get is the follow up that happens after that lashing out at his sister the same day of the funeral. And then where that lashing out goes is f- it's, it, it does, it's not logical. And quite honestly, it's just mean. It's really, really mean. Here we have an interview with an ex-boyfriend of Brenda's. And what does he have to say? I mean, it was so bad. Okay, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, my niece, when she was, when she was born, okay. Uh, I wanted to go to the hospital. She didn't want me to go. Why? Because she didn't want me around my sister-in-law. She was that bad. Uh, and she was, I mean, she was cutting herself in my bathroom when I came back from, because I went anyway. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. I just don't wanna tell her. I went, came back, she was cutting, she says, you were around your niece, weren't you? I said, yes, of course. What'd she say? Uh, she was crying and she, her hand was full of blood. He goes into several other instances, one where he felt like she was threatening the life of his mother. Um, However, when asked if he thought that she was capable of doing this specifically to Jonathan, he doesn't think so. So it's really weird because a lot of his deposition information seems like it could be supporting the thought that she has something to do with this case. But ultimately, when they bring it down to the question and ask him, uh, he says no. Now, from what I understand, she also gave a deposition. I have not seen any of that. I'm sure that is being kept under tight uh, wraps. Um, But from what I understand, they did ask specifically if she shot Jonathan and she pleaded the fifth. She did not answer that question according to information that I've found. Uh, A really good resource on this case has been the facebook.com forward slash Jonathan Cruz cold case page. That's where I got to see a lot of the Facebook communication as well as some other videos that detail some of the text communication between Brenda and Jonathan's family. So I highly recommend that you check this out if you want to dive into this case more as well. All right, I've got some photos that I want to run through with you guys. Uh, This first one is a report from an officer that arrived on the scene, and it's basically what he was told uh, from Brenda. So let's see what the story is according to him. Lazaro arrived at the apartment at about 1600 hours on February 2nd, 2014. Lazaro and Cruz had previously been arguing about another girl named Emily. So when Lazaro arrived at the apartment, they were not really talking to each other. Lazaro said they did not talk for most of the night, but they were watching TV together. A little later in the night, Cruz and Lazaro went to bed. Cruz fell asleep, but Lazaro did not. Cruz woke up after a short time and said that he was hungry. Cruz ordered Chinese food and had it delivered to the apartment. They both ate and continued to watch TV. Cruz told Lazaro, quote, I love you. Lazaro replied, I love you too, but then started talking about Emily again, which upset Cruz. At this time, Lazaro was sitting on the floor at the foot of the bed and Cruz was in bed. He said, baby, I love you. I'm going to show you that I love you. Cruz told Lazaro to cover her ears multiple times, but Lazaro refused. Then she heard a gunshot, got up, and saw that Cruz had shot himself. Lazaro observed blood underneath Cruz and a black handgun on the bed. 
She immediately put her hands on his chest to stop the bleeding and then picked up the phone and dialed 911. Lazaro stated that Cruz was a very nice person and never indicated suicidal tendencies. She stated that he was not under the influence of alcohol or any narcotics. She also stated that Cruz was always happy. Her and Cruz had been dating for about three months, and this was the third argument that they had ever been in. Um, I don't know if I believe that just based on the Facebook communication that I've seen alone. It seems like arguing was a regular thing in their relationship. But like I stated before, I'm looking at that through uh, the filter of someone else that has gone through that communication and pulled out those particular pieces. But so one of the things I always struggle with is when I think someone is not being honest um, th there's certainly an aspect of truth that comes out in that information because they don't want to have to remember too much. So they try to line it up with the truth as much as possible. What I'm wondering about here is the order of events of them hanging out, watching TV in bed. That certainly is supported by how he is found. Uh, it looks like he's gotten ready for bed. He's actually in the covers. He's over to the side, like I mentioned. She could have been on the other side. TV's right across from them. Uh, I don't think the rest of the apartment was furnished very well because he had just moved in there. He didn't have a whole lot of stuff yet. So I don't think there was anywhere else they could have even been hanging out to watch TV, but that's uh, I'm not 100% on that. But this whole... Uh, this whole situation she's talking about where, you know, he goes to bed, he wakes up and he's hungry. Is it possible that he was asleep and then she came in with the gun? I don't know. I think that's something that we have to consider. Keep in mind, this is a guy that's trained in martial arts. One of the things that his mother talked about at the Q&A session in particular was that he had showed his mother how to deal with someone pointing a gun at you. Uh, that and she said that he in particular was very good at it at you know uh, knocking the gun away and getting control of it basically and pointing it away from your body. So is it likely that he could have been asleep? I really have to wonder and I've really been considering after looking back at all this case. Let's go ahead and check out the next photo here. Uh, so Gray has created a 3D model of his body. We're going to be looking at that through the next couple photos. Here you can see the trajectory, like I mentioned, from left front chest to uh, the right rear chest, and you can see the angle um, and the placement of the gun. It, just imagine if this arm could come up uh, and grab this gun, perhaps he could have used his thumb uh, for pulling the trigger, but if he was trying to wrap his hand around to hold that gun in a natural position, that would be a pretty interesting and strange position for you to put your arm in, especially with how far up his body that is. Uh, in terms of his right shoulder, his right shoulder was also injured at this time. He had just seen a doctor for that a couple days ago. So thinking that his right shoulder could have really made that trajectory, once again, I'd have to assume that the only way it could happen is if his thumb was on the trigger. Uh, and even then, it's a pretty tough shot. It's a pretty tough angle for his arms to actually make that happen. Uh, of course, if you imagine someone standing at his side, I don't know. Here is a close up on uh, the entry, uh, the entry wound as it's going in. And once again, just so you get a really good idea, the angle is fairly sharp here. So that gun had to really be pointing uh, in in a very bizarre direction for him to have been holding it himself. And here it is uh, mocked up with him in bed. Once again, just really showing the angle of the gunfire. And Gray even went as far as doing a version where what if it was a woman that was holding the weapon in that particular position. And in terms of it lining up with the trajectory that we saw on the last photo, I don't know. Pretty compelling information. Also worth noting, here's a picture of them actually in bed and it does appear, um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of particular about what side of the bed I'm on uh, when I'm in bed with my wife. And he is on the same side in the actual photo as well. So there are a couple of things to talk about uh, when it comes to the gun. And Sheila herself has said that she thinks the gun is the smoking gun in this case. And for a criminal prosecution, I certainly agree. I think uh, it's the one item that can give us a little bit of the story of what's really going on here. Uh, the clip is removed from the gun. 
On top of that, when the gun fires, I know several of you out there are probably wondering, well, what happened to the spent cartridge? When it ejected from the gun, what direction did it go? Because that could help us determine uh, which way the gun might have been twisted. Not that the angle would have changed, but if someone was holding it or if he was holding it, uh, the grip might have been in a different direction and the ejector for the casing would have been facing a different way. Unfortunately, the gun had an issue called stove piping, where the gun fires and the cartridge starts to escape but the hammer slides back and actually catches the cartridge and it leaves it pointing up. It looks like a little stovepipe. That's why they, they call it that. I've been doing all kinds of research trying to understand how that stovepiping thing happens. I mean, it seems to me there is a certain element of chance that it can just happen at random times. It's tough because in all these cases, when you're talking about these kind of chance things, you could say, you know, 95% of the time this shouldn't happen. And in this 5% it did. But is that really enough in terms of persuading uh, a judge or a jury? Um, probably not. The thing that really bothers me about this case is the ammo clip for that gun. The clip was actually found here in this drawer of his ties. And I, can, I gotta tell you, the guy's got a really nice tie collection and people wonder, uh, why are you going to put a greasy ammo clip under your ties? Uh, I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense either. And his friend, Jacob, was actually shown the gun earlier that day. And at the time he saw it, uh, it was fully loaded and it was stored in a different location. It wasn't stored in this uh, tie drawer. So a lot of strange stuff going on here. I know this episode has gone really long, but I just want to share one more thing with you guys. And that is the gunshot residue report. Uh, this is just a... a a part of it. Uh, it is also numerous, numerous pages. But just to give you some clear information about the gunshot residue, uh, they took a black sweatshirt that she was wearing and they tested that. And just so you know, specifically, um, they're looking for particles that are found on that item that would lead them to believe that either someone fired a firearm uh, or they were handling a firearm or a firearm component that has been fired, or being in the proximity of a firearm when it was fired, or wiping a firearm or firearm component on a garment. So a pretty wide definition. I would love if they would be able to test and say, you know, uh, we can specifically say that these particles were made from the actual act of it being fired. But from what I understand, from what we were taught, uh, it could be transferred as well. And considering that she put her hand on his chest, obviously there was gunshot residue that was going to be on his chest. Uh, she could have transferred some of that to herself. Uh, in terms of her sweatshirt, I don't know how practical it is for some of these areas that were noted on her sweatshirt to have transfer from her, you know, putting her hand on his chest. Uh, they found particles on the front upper left, on the front upper right, on the front lower left, and on the front lower right. Kind of seems like it's all in front of her. Uh, they did also find some on the left cuff, on the right cuff, and then also on the right side of the hood. Uh, however, they specifically did not find any on the left side of the hood. So let's take that information and let's go back to Gray's 3D model of the room here. Uh, if she is sitting here, and let me just say, it gets even worse if you try to think that she's sitting at the actual foot of the bed, because I think her exposure to that residue would have been much less, but let's put her where I think she was here kind of at the side of the foot of the bed. Her left side is actually much closer to him than her right. However, it seems like the right side of her hoodie uh, is, is getting hit more with this gunshot residue for some reason than the left, in particular, the actual hood. There's none found on the left side of her hood, which if you imagine someone sitting here, the height of where her hood is, the side that it's facing, I'm not an expert. I'm just trying to be logical. I would figure that that would probably be the area to have the most gunshot residue, not none. Now, where it gets really interesting with this report is when it comes to their hands. 
In terms of her hands, they found gunshot residue on the back and palm of both her left and right hands. And most of it was found on the palm of her right hand in terms of concentration. For him, they only found particles on the back of his right hand. One more thing before we leave this video clip, his cell phone was found cracked. The screen had been cracked, which no one noticed that he had a cracked screen on his cell phone before, but it was actually found stuffed between the mattress and the box spring uh, right around here somewhere. Why is his cell phone in there? Um, one potential theory to me is if she did send the text message uh, to Emily, perhaps she saw Emily's reply and it upset her and she slammed it, threw it, broke it somehow, um, and then thought, oh my God, they're going to be able to trace my fingerprints all over that thing and I don't want them to find it, so I have to hide it. And she put it in there. Uh, I kind of have the same feeling if we're going down, and this is just theorizing, if we're going down these theories that she is involved in this, uh, the clip for the gun, could she have removed it and tried to hide it in his tie drawer? Um, possibly. Why would she have done that? I'm not necessarily certain. Uh, her ex-boyfriend says that he did take her to a shooting range, but she wasn't great with weapons. I mean, she knew how to shoot, but uh, that she wasn't particularly good with them. Could it be that for some reason uh, she hit the release, the clip release, and the clip slid out and she just didn't want to try to handle the gun more to put it back into place and potentially transfer more of her fingerprints all over it? So instead, she just took the clip and stuffed it in the tie drawer. I don't know. I also don't know if those items have been tested for her fingerprints. And even if they were, he just moved there a week or two before. If she helped him move, her fingerprints could be all over everything that's that's in his place. So I don't know. Really, really hard to, to figure this one out. Um, I do want to just end this video on some type of positive note. Uh, so one more time back to the screen share at this memorial tribute page. Uh, to Jonathan. If friends desire, donations may be given in Jonathan's name to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. On behalf of myself and my amazing supporters on Patreon, PayPal, however you guys support me, uh, thank you for allowing me to do things like this. I'm going to make a donation specifically in Jonathan's name to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital just as soon as I'm done editing this video. Um, just want to put some kind of positive spin on all this. And let me just say thank you to his family for sharing time with us, for being so open with us at the session. Thank you to Sheila for doing all the hard work of putting that session together and really trying something different in terms of crowdsourcing information. I think it's a model that uh, could be very, very fruitful. If not on this case, on, on maybe some other case in the future, I really hope that she'll keep working on that. And once again, my hat's off to my YouTube buddy, Gray, for doing some amazing work. And thank you so much for spending some time with me, Gray, showing me uh, the materials that you had done on this case and, and taking me through it. I really, really appreciate it. Here's where I turn it over to you, Brain Scratchers. Uh, I think I've touched on just about everything <laughs> with this case. I'm trying to jam in, you know, four hours of a session plus countless hours of research over the, <laughs> the week on this. Uh, I think I've hit all the major points. You might find some little tidbits here or there that I haven't quite addressed. If you do, let's talk about them in the comments below. Please be sure to share sources if you find those as well. Um, this is one of those cases, though, where we're really looking at primarily two theories. Did Jonathan do this to himself? Did Brenda do it to him? And if Brenda did it to him, was it intentional? Was it possibly accidental? Uh, same thing for Jonathan. Was it intentional? Was it possibly accidental? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I hope you guys will dig in. I'm going to have a bunch of links in the description box below where you can spend much more time taking a look at this case. And I'll also have uh, Sheila's website down there. So if you think you find something compelling, feel free to shoot it her way. Who knows? Maybe you can help move things forward for this family and help justice show up if this is a case that deserves it. I kind of have a feeling it is, but uh, it's hard to know for sure. I'll certainly be keeping an eye on the civil trial. Thank you so much for hanging out with me on this episode. I really appreciate you guys being there. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on Monday on the Lord and Arts Channel.